beside me because taking anointing upon my life where they said I am late you just see me pass by where they said I cannot make it you just see me pass by where they said nothing is going to happen you just see me pass by where they said I was poor you just see me walking in prosperity in the name of Jesus because I walk in divine speed am I talking to somebody give a lot of clap offering and give a lot of shout and let the devil know that you are in town hallelujah please be seated in heavenly places welcome somebody with a with a high five and tell the person I don't know whether you were here on Wednesday uh, yeah yeah and so uh, we will say it they don't know it they will repeat after us then they'll be asking what is it hallelujah you know when people are confused that is when God gives them food of uncertainty you see when you get to the wilderness and you are confused God is going to give you manna and manna means what is this so you don't know what it is but the people who have crossed the, the wilderness and have entered into the into the uh, Canaan they eat corn and wine hallelujah they eat corn and they drink wine and they take the great big grapes hallelujah so uh, the person who wasn't here last the whole of last week how many of you know that we are fasting ah uh, you forgot I'm sure this morning you've balanced some watch and balanced some banco. That's why you are so dull like that. Tell us for this pastor. Tell them as for this man of God. He doesn't like dull, dull people. Ha! Huh, welcome. Uh, I can see that's why your, wife, your husband is wearing shades in the midst of darkness. <laughs> Boss, your wife is around now, so you're laughing like that. Amen. Doctor, how? Good. Welcome. Thank you. Since when did you come? This is a family service. This is a family. Since when have you been? Wednesday. Bro, that's why I didn't see you on Wednesday. And I didn't see you on Thursday. And I didn't see you on Friday. Normally he's around, but he wasn't around. Now I understand. God is revealing things. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, I, like, I like that, the first one, that the, the light is. Because when you light up everybody's face, when I see people, I'll make comments I shouldn't be making. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, as for, as for this house, we just enjoy ourselves. You know, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. God's house is a place of laughter. God's house is a place of pleasure. God's house is a place of celebration. It is not a, a place of mourning. Hallelujah. So turn to somebody and say, the person, if you see me laugh, if you see me jump up, if you see me do something crazy, I'm in my father's house. Hallelujah. And I came to celebrate. And tell the person, if you sit by me, if you sit there and you are door, door, door. Me, I don't like door, door, door people. Though. So relocate your geography. And then go and sit where the door, door, door people are. So even the front row people, tell them, even the front row people, none of them is door, 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 door. Uh, do you hear what I am saying? None of them is, this one through people, none of them is dull, dull. When you see that they are dull, dull, not tap them and say, can we change our seat? <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't know, we don't like dollus. Which woman would like to marry a dull man? Which man would also like to marry a dull woman? Do you know that Samson had a problem with the women of Israel? Because they were dull. Get it? They were too dull. And the, and the reason is, is because, you know, when Samson, the, uh, in Judges chapter 14, when Samson wanted a wife, and then his mother and his father told him, why do you want to go into the Philistine? He said, ah, I like this woman because she gives me much pleasure. She says she knows how to please me. She gives me pleasure. I've told you that there are three reasons why when a man looks at a woman, forgive me, this is not adult education, this is Bible. When a man looks at a woman, he looks at him here, he looks at him here, looks at him there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you interest him here and you come and live in there, then this place is permitted. Because now you and him have joined covenant and it's called marriage. Hallelujah. He said, take care for me, for she pleases me well. 
That's the reason. So when you are with somebody who is dull, dull, don't like the person, what kind of life is this? Hallelujah. You're living with the man when you push, he doesn't push. Everything. He's like phlegm. He's too phlegmatic. When you push him, he doesn't push. He's not exciting. Which lady would like to marry somebody like that? Want to marry somebody who makes you laugh, somebody who makes you smile. And one day, when the person is coming and shakes something, say, Hallelujah. I know what is going before me. Oh, ye mountains of Gilboa. This is what I want. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I'm asking somebody who would like to marry a lady who works like Django. Hallelujah. Amen. So tell the person, don't be dull. Be flexible. Hallelujah. You know, when you're dealing with God, you need to be flexible. The Bible says, the spirit is, uh, uh, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wind bloweth where it listeth. The things of God are like moves of the wind. And sometimes it blows where it listeth. So if you want to enjoy the benefit of the wind, you need to be where the wind is. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So those of you who are not around for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, tell them. And and what? what how do you how do you say? Uh, no. What, what do you say before we say Shafa? Yeah. No. Ayala. And then and then. So first of all, on your marks. Then Ayala. Uh, uh, soon first. Eh? Okay, all right, so let's go. <laughs> you don't know what we are talking about. Nah, 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 nah. All right, on your marks, get set, and. And then let's do the second one. Let it paint them. Pa. On your marks, get set, and. Ayala. And now the, 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 the last one. I will uh, 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 do, the, do the what? Hurry up and do the what? So, turn to someone and say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Hurry up, hurry up. Why are you late, Dodo? Hurry up. And do the what? The Shafa. Hallelujah. You see, you are not there. You don't know what we are talking about. You, see, you don't know what that If you don't do the Shafa in your life, you can't, you can't have anything. If you don't do the Shafa, you can't do the, anything. The Shafa is very prominent. Whatever God wants to do with you, you need to do the Shafa. Oh, you see, you're not there. Go to YouTube. You get it? First of all, you need to lean forward and you need to see into the future. You need to lean forward and you have to have a picture. You lean forward in expectation, you lean forward with faith. You don't lean back. Some of you are leaning too far back. But when you lean forward, you lean forward with expectation, you lean forward in faith. And not only that, but then you begin to see. Look at what uh, Habakkuk said. I will stand upon my watch. That word watch there is the Shafa. Amen. Amen. That's the reason why you need to be at, mid- at the services. Because certain powerful revelatory truths are being thrown at you. Your progress is determined by the revelation you have. Your progress is, is dependent upon the intelligence that you have. The spiritual intelligence that you have. Even your progress in primary school all the way to secondary school is dependent upon the physical intelligence that you have. And if you are, in, you are dull and you are not intelligent, you struggle. In the same way, spiritual things are determined by the amount of spiritual intelligence that you have. And the spiritual information that you have. And your intelligence, is ba- it must be based on your power of curiosity. You must be curious. And when you're curious, then God will supply you the necessary intelligence to take you forward. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 2, Paul said, I went up by a revelation. I went up by divine intelligence. I went up by divine information. I went up by divine inspiration. So you need the divine intelligence and you also need uh, um, the divine intelligence comes with by divine information. Divine information gives you divine intelligence. And divine intelligence, much with divine information, gives you divine inspiration. Hallelujah. Amen. You are inspired by the information you have. You are inspired, or, or what do you call it? Be inspired by the information you have. The information you will get will make you excited, or the information you have will make you depressed. So, Paul said, I went up. By divine information. So you need the information. You need the revelatory truths we are teaching from Monday to Friday. And we are praying with them 
you know. He said, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them. That said, uh, let's just yes, uh, He went up by revelation. So on Monday to Friday, we are on our second week of a fast. And I'd like to encourage everybody to join the fast. I know some of you won't get into the fast. I know the reason. Because you say you are taking medication. What's the medication? Paracetamol. <laughs> you know, paracetamol has become a reason for... Um, not fasting. No problem. We don't have an issue with you. It is your decision. It is nobody is forcing you. It's your decision. But of course, if you're pregnant and you are uh, under medication and the doctors tell you you need to eat, there's a particular type of medication. It's called steroids. If you're on steroids, prednisolone, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, that's a thing. Yeah. Reverend Dr. Mark, uh, 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 God, I, am, am I right? <laughs> prednisolone, say it with steroid. Yeah, yeah. Even if it is not, don't tell them. <laughs> I don't want to look into my wife's face. Do you know the reason why I can mention prednisolone like that? The way they prescribe it for me. Small thing, no, no, you have to go on the prednisolone. And I don't like steroids. Because steroids will make you fat. It will bloat you. So you see, sometimes our pregnancies is not based on anything because of prednisolone. So forgive me, I've tried abortion. It didn't work. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah, the words of a pastor. <laughs> uh, pastor Abre, listen to this. <laughs> but listen to this. You need to be on the fast. It will help you. When you fast, what happens? Fasting kills the canal and it elevates the spiritual. Fasting dulls your carnality and elevates your spirituality. Fasting provides you an, an opportunity to kill the desires of the flesh. You know, that's why when you're fasting, everything is nice. Even if they are cooking bela, it smells nice and you want to taste it. That's why when you break your fast because you wanted something so badly, when you, after you take the food, you say, mm, it's not even as nice as I thought. Why? It was the flesh crying out. So fasting is good for your spirit. It builds up your spirit. Number two, fasting also is medically good for you. It is medicine now. Hallelujah. You need to sometimes slow down your tummy and let your stomach rest a little bit. You are eating too much. You know, so your stomach is overweight. That is why you come to prayer meetings. Shall we pray? Father, my God, I thank you. Excuse me, God. When they ask you, then you say, Greece. It's not Greece. You need to fast. And sometimes you can tell the people who are not fasting, you know. I remember in, in school, a friend of ours, we were fasting nonstop, and he came to the prayer meeting, and the way he was shouting, jumping, and the, the, all of us were slow. I mean, we're going, we're, going, we're going 40 days and 40 nights, and all of us were very slow. But the way he was jumping, and ah. So we asked him, and then he said, Charlie, the, when he was leading prayer meeting, we all the gas. Only to get to his uh, uh, room uh, in this hall, and then his his roommate said, "Hey, oh, oh, you need to go. Let me. Are you eating again?" Then we looked at him. Then we said, ha! "So you balance yourself." Then he said, "You drag a call, you a boy. You think you think we shall shout with hey. <laughs> He balanced himself before he came to the prayer meeting. So at six o'clock, you can balance yourself and come to the prayer meeting. Okay, Hallelujah, <laughs> Amen. Fasting also helps. It helps your health. It is very, very good. Doctors will tell you that sometimes you need to slow down the, 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 the stomach a little bit so that you can, can build. The stomach will clean itself up and then you allow the stomach to rest. You are eating too much. When we fast, we gain spiritually and we also gain physically. So that's the reason why. And sometimes you need grace because fasting, I'm telling you, it is not very easy. I remember yesterday we were passing by a restaurant and it was smoke that was coming out of the restaurant. But I, I wanted to swallow even the smoke. <laughs> I wanted to swallow the smoke. And I even remember one of those days we were fasting, I was passing by some kebab seller. And when I got to the kebab cellar, I sat down there and then, I mean, I sat beside the cellar and the way the kebab smoke was coming, then I said, oh Lord, if it be your will, let this kebab cellar uh, either go away, but if it is your will, let him offer me something. And then the kebab cellar took and said, will you want to take something? And I said, the Lord has spoken. Oh boy, it is your stomach calling now. 
So now we need grace also to be able to fast. So we're going to stand up right now and say a couple of prayers quickly as we deal with the fast ahead. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. And then just begin to lift up fire and say, Papa, give me the grace. Give me the strength to be able to go through this fast period. I want to, I want to tap into the mercy seat. I want to tap into the altar of grace. I want to tap into the altar of blessing. There are things that I need from you, Papa. Please supply. Let this week be a glorious week. Let this week be a speedy week of divine intervention. Let this week, oh God, be a week where I will laugh. Give me a testimony this week in the name of Jesus. As I come into your presence, hear my cry, oh Lord. Attend unto my prayer from the ends of the earth. Will I cry unto thee? And when my heart is overwhelmed, please lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That is higher than I. I'll take it again from the top. Let's all do it together. Lift up your right hand before we pray. Hear my cry, O oh Lord, at unto my prayer. We're gonna pray. You're gonna you're gonna raise a cry before heaven mm, from the end of the earth. Will I oh. Lift up your right hand, Papa. We are coming on. Angels, make way. And my heart is open. Please lead me, Lord. Please lead me to the one that, that is higher than I. Come on, let's pray, girl. Open your mouth and let's pray. Ask the Lord to give you grace. Ask the Lord to speak. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Papa, hear the cry. Hear the cry. Hear the cry. Hear the cry. Hear the cry of your people as we ascend upon Mount Zion. As we ascend, to God, and stand before your throne of grace. I stand before your throne of mercy, reminding you of covenant, reminding you of what you said, reminding you of what you can do. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So make a date with us from Monday to Friday. And please be seated. Right. We're coming to something that we need to uh, let you know. You know, there are four different types of giving in the house of God. Or there are four different types of offering. Ah, Pastor, what are you saying? If you remember uh, in Malachi, it says, bring um, the tithe and the offerings. Bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse. So there are four different types of giving. There are four different ways in which we give to God. Number one is alms given. And arms given is a test of your compassion. That is giving to one another. So give somebody a high five and say, don't just give me a high five. Put something in your arms and slap my hands with it. If the person is not giving to you, tell the person, I, didn't be I don't believe you are wicked. Uh, so, so give the person a high five again. And say, give me a high five and put something into my hands. Yeah, the wallet and the... Uh, and, uh, and uh, Ernesto, you are just laughing my wife and you are not giving anything. We are prepared to do. Uh, any deliverance. Hallelujah. So, 
That is alms given, we give to a brother in need and it's a test of our compassion because we feel for people, we know they are going through challenges and when, then we give to them. Don't confuse your, your alms given to your love given or your love offering. They are two different things. Love offering is supposed to be given to God. We give for, to him because we love him. Jesus said where your treasures are, that's where your heart will be. So love offering is also a test of your love for God. It shows where your heart is. You see, we can always measure commitment. Commitment is not just by, by, by mouth, I am committed. No. Commitment is invest, involves the investment of your time, your talents, and your treasures. So where your treasures are, indicates where your heart is. You love your wife, you go and buy gold for her. May some man buy you gold. Hallelujah. Yeah. What, what did I just say? <laughs> well, minus me. <laughs> minus ish. Me boy, well, why God have mercy on me. Uh, close people's eyes to gold, though. Uh, 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 uh. Shut up over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, so what you love, you give to. And you can't say you love somebody, you don't want to give anything to the person. That is why your wife would buy you a nice shirt. That is why your husband will buy you a nice dress. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So love is also accompanied by giving. So as, as for you, you are only receiving and you don't give. It is called a, a parasitic relationship. And God doesn't like parasite. You are like mosquito. So as for you, you are always on the receiving end. So there are some wives, you are always on the receiving end. You are not ever on the giving end. Come on, hurry up and give him something that he would also know that my wife cares for me. Am I talking for to some men? They are quiet. Am I talking to some men? For some men? Am I talking for you? And there, but there are also some men that, hey, even if you give your wife 10 CDs to go to the market, when she comes back, she has to come and do accounts. Hallelujah. And so, there's love offering, which is, it comes as the test of your love. Then there is tithing, which is a test of your obedience. Now, God demands the tithe. And God says, bring the tithe and the offerings into the house. People say, tithing is over. You don't need to tithe again. And Jesus spoke against tithing. Read your scriptures very well. He said, you tithe on his rule and common, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. This also you ought to do. He didn't say, don't do this, but he said, you also must do this. So in addition to whatever you think you are given, also do the weightier matters of the law. Also means in addition, hallelujah. So Jesus didn't come to, to cut out. And by the way, why do you want to walk in the blessings of Abraham but deny, or you want to walk in the rewards of Abraham but you deny the responsibility of Abraham? Why do you want that? Why do you want the blessing or the rewards of a relationship, but you don't want the responsibility that goes with the relationship? So, tithing is a test of your obedience. Then there's another one called sowing. And sowing is a test of your faith. That is the seed. It's a test of your faith. You are believing God for something, or there's something ahead of you. Then you sow a seed. And the Bible says... Uh, seed time and harvest time will never depart from the face of the earth. Tithing and offerings rebuke the devourer, but the seed brings the harvest. You are quiet. I said tithing and offerings rebuke the devourer, but the seed brings the harvest. He said, as far as heaven and earth exist, seed time and harvest time will never depart from the face of the earth. And in Second Chronicles chapter 9, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 9, there's a powerful scripture over there that says, he giveth, um, now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed soon, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So now, listen, somebody is ministering and as for what the person is ministering as for him he is given but it is the receiver who determines whether this is bread or this is seed it is the receiver who determines whether this is bread or whether this is seed when you, it, it is bread you eat it but when it is seed you sow it 
And the harvest doesn't come by the bread, but the harvest comes by the seed. Am I talking to somebody? So you would have some money in your hands. You determine whether it is seed or you determine whether it is harvest. Uh, or it is bread. And as a bread, you eat it. Nobody has eaten bread and then goes to stand and reproduces bread. After you eat bread, what comes out is not bread. It is destroyed bread. But when the seed goes down and the seed must germinate and to sow a seed is an act of faith. So seeding is a test of your faith. I am believing God. Ask the farmer who goes and dig up the uh, furrows in the ground and then begins to plant a seed. And then he knows that I am planting the seed, but I am looking up to God to water the seed and I'm looking up to God to do everything for me to have a harvest. That's why the Bible says, and seed time is always accompanied by pain. The Bible says, he that goes sowing in tears shall likewise come back rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. So the seed is, is a painful thing. Looking at something and saying, even when there is nothing. So the widow of Zarephath said, I have nothing in my, ha- in my house. And Elijah said, you bring me what you have. You bring the seed. And when she brought the seed, the cake of bread and the cruise of oil never failed. So, seed time is, is a very, very difficult time. You don't know what to do. You don't eat this thing. And immediately you begin to mention seed. The enemy will begin to paint pictures for you to make it bread. Because there are needs, there are challenges that the, that the thing in your hand must meet. So, seed time is different from harvest time. So, we have something in, in church. We call it the first fruit. And the first fruit is our seed time. That is when we take, let me say this before, it is not compulsory. It is not obligatory. It is an act of faith. If your faith can go into that, that's fine. If you don't have faith for it, that is also, no. We will not condemn you, but we have done it over and over and over again and it has yielded results, including visible, tangible, angelic visitations. Hallelujah. Visible, tangible, angelic visitations. And I'll give you the testimonies. So, we take our first fruit, that is the first salary of January, and we sow it as a seed, and it is not going into Reverend Marquis' pocket. No, 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 no. It is going into the building. Hallelujah. We need to finish this building this year, isn't it? So, when we bring in our seed, our first salary, and it's an act of faith, nobody pushes you. So it's an act of faith. I said, I'm going to stretch up my faith a little. And that's how we did it. I started it first with my family. I started it first, but did it for a number of times, for a number of years before I began to teach it. Because Ezra 17 says, Ezra purpose in his heart to study the law of the Lord, do it, and then teach it. So I did it, and it worked. And then now I can teach it. Does it work? Yes. Does it work? Yes. It works. Because you can't outgive God. And one way or the other, the miracles, there are testimonies, two powerful testimonies of angelic visitation. Number one, we had a student, a, a, a little girl, who was in, in church, and her mother brought the first fruit. When the mother brought the first fruit, what then happened was she, she was studying with her mates, and then they were studying with their laptops, and then armed robbers came to that place. When the armed robbers came, the armed robbers then put guns on them and asked them to give their phones and their laptops. But one way or the other, she, was, she didn't know what came over her. She just picked her laptop and started running and a, and a mobile phone and started running. So the armed robber, one of them pointed his gun at her and shot, first shot, it didn't happen. He cocked his gun again and shot the second shot. It didn't happen. Why? Because something is speaking for that person. Hallelujah. I said, something is speaking for that lady. You don't understand. When the woman with the uh, alabaster box, when she broke the alabaster box on the feet of Jesus, it looks like waste. But guess what? Very soon, her brother was going to die. And I'm talking about Mary Magdalena. And when her brother was going to die, and when her brother died, Martha came talking. Nothing happened. But when Mary came, she didn't talk much. She held the feet of Jesus, and Jesus groaned and said, "Mm." And for the first time, God cried. Read it. Why did he scream? Why? Because that touch, 
It's an altar she had built there at the feet with her oil, with her alabaster box of speaking that oil. And when she touched it, she reminded God of the covenant that she had made. So even though her brother was dead, he has to come back. Hallelujah. So heaven canceled his visa to, to heaven and he was deported back to earth. Hallelujah. Even though he had stayed three days. Am I talking to somebody? May your seed begin to speak for you. May your altar, your seed become an altar Amen. that will speak for you Amen. in places where you don't have a voice. Amen. Amen. Second testimony of angelic intervention. This woman's house uh, built a house that husband had traveled and the kids too were in school. They had also left home. And then she was staying in that place. It was a newly developed place or a new developing place. And so they had built their house there and they needed to, uh, she, need, someone, she needed to stay there. And so in the middle of the night, she was asleep when she just heard some noise in her bedroom. And when she opened her eyes, there were armed robbers that covered their faces with a gun on her. And she didn't even know how they came in. But all she realized was they asked her to bring in the money that had been sent to her that week. So she gave the money. And then the uh, jewelry and everything. And then they were packing it into a bag. They asked her for a bag. She gave them a bag. And then when they finished collecting the things, they said they were going to rip her. And then they removed their mask. When an armed robber removes his mask, it means you're not going to leave to testify. And when they removed their mask and she was begging and they said, this is what we want to do. Then all of a sudden, she had the screech of car tires, like a forward uh, diesel engine. You get it come into her house and then she had the feet of boots on, on the floor, on the concrete of her house. And then the people in, in fear ran away and left the bag and the jewelry and the money. And they ran out of the... Uh, window and they, they ran away and then she was there waiting for the police that she thought had come to and no, nobody appeared she waited 30 minutes shaking nothing happened 45 minutes nothing happened. one hour so she decided to go to the there was nobody there there was nobody there may god protect you may god protect you what is yours cannot be taken away Amen. by anybody in the name of jesus Amen. hallelujah so we bring our first fruit. So that is voluntary. It is not by force. Amen. Hallelujah. Now this morning I like to, man, I need to do all these things and then go on to my sermon. So here's my sermon. And this morning I want to talk to you about geography, the blessing of God that is tied to a geography. Now there are some geographical places in the Bible. They are not there for decorative purposes. Their names are not mentioned for um, uh, um, to beautify the Bible or beautify the scriptures, but their names hold meaning and their whole names hold a teaching, a, a principle for us. Blessings of God are sometimes tied to your geography. So if you are not in, if you are not, if Joseph is not in Egypt, he's Pharaoh will dream, but he's not there. If Joseph doesn't go to, and not all geographical places, God takes you. When I talk about geography, it can be emotional geography, it can be situational or circumstantial geography, or it can be a physical place. I mean, if Joseph didn't go to uh, Hebron, he had to move from Hebron to Shechem. Shechem is the place of the direction, that is the neck that gives you direction. Ten is ten words. That's when he met the man of, of Shechem. Then, then or, or the Ishmaelites. And then also there is a Dotain. Dotain too is a revelatory place because that's the place where your dreams may die. So sometimes you come into certain situations that threatens the dream that you have. I dream that you're, I'm going to be this. I have plans. I have ideas that God is going to make me a big person. God is going to make me a multi-millionaire. Am I talking to somebody? And something happened that arrests the dream. Something happened that breaks the dream. Something happened. Because in Dota Inn, there is a, there is a conspiracy against you for the dream to die. Because Dota Inn was a place where the brothers of Joseph said, here comes the dreamer. Let us kill him and then we will see what will become of his dreams. So Dota Inn is a place where when you get there, and it could be an emotional place, it could be a place where you receive a setback. It's a place where you receive some persecution. It's a place where you receive some attack. It's a place where people stood against you. People hurt you. People threw spears at you. And as a result of your hurt, you gave up the dream. Out of your hurt of discouragement, despair, despondency, depression, all the negative deeds, you became a victim 
of aborted dreams. So, places like that are very, very powerful. And then it was in Egypt that Joseph's dream became a reality. So you see, geographical places are very powerful places. And they are not just there for decorative purpose. But God brings us to that place. Now in 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 46. 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 There's a powerful scripture over there. 1 Kings. They've gone to Isaiah. Thank you. Somebody wants to be a prophet by force. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And uh, we've already started. The place we are interested in is Jezreel. Jezreel. Why Jezreel? Why didn't Elijah run to, to um, um, Jerusalem? Why didn't he run to Bethel? The place where you will see angels ascending and descending. Why didn't he even run to Bethlehem? Why didn't he even run to, to uh, Mount Horeb? But he ran, why didn't he run or stay in Mount Carmel? Why did he have to run to Jezreel? And when I was looking at Jezreel, Jezreel is so powerful. And last week, we showed, I showed you that he had to run to the gate of Jezreel. Not just to Jezreel, but to the gate of Jezreel. And the reason why he went there, I showed you that Jezreel, we are two Jezreels in the Bible. One is Jezreel of Judah, and the other is Jezreel of Issachar. And Issachar means payment. Issachar was the, play, the son that Leah and Rachel, Leah had to buy the husband for a night. Leah had to buy the husband for a night. And she gave birth to, to uh, uh, Issachar. And then she said, the Lord has paid me for my hire. That means I bought my husband's favor. I bought these sperms, excuse my language, for mandrix, with mandrix. And therefore, it means payment. But Jezreel also means God will sow. That means God will give to you. So it's not you always sowing into God. Sometimes God determines, I am going to sow. In the name of Jesus, we are in a year that God will what? Sow. You are not saying amen. amen. I said you are in a year that God will sow also. Amen. So prepare your spiritual womb. Jesus. God doesn't sow by coming to carry a seed like mango tree and come and put it in you. But God sows in you into the womb of your spirit with his word. Hallelujah. So God speaks prophetically into the womb of your spirit. So as I am standing here, I am impregnating you by putting a seed from heaven, a prophetic seed into your word. Anna walks into the temple praying. All she did was when they asked, what kind of prayer was this? He said, I'm emptying the, my womb of bitterness. He said, I'm pouring out the bitterness of my womb. So it was not Anna's prayer that gave her a son. All it did was clear her stomach or clear her womb. But it was the word of the prophet. He called Eli. He said, stop prayer. Go home. And in the fullness of time, God will visit you. Hallelujah. So it was the word that gave her a seed. You, you, you understand? So Mary is walking around and all of a sudden, an angel comes to Mary and gives her a, a seed in the womb of her spirit. In the name of Jesus, I cause you to be pregnant with the seed of prosperity. Amen. I cause you to be pregnant Jesus. with the seed of progress. Amen. I cause you to be pregnant Amen. with the seed of abundance. Amen. In the name of Jesus Amen. I hear Amen. the sound of abundance Amen. of rain. Am I talking to somebody? Ah. Jump from your chair and say he's talking about me. He's talking about me. So it is the word. So people say, okay, pastor said God will sow. What is God going to sow? He's going to give you a word. A rima word. A powerful word like I'm prophesying to you right now. Hey, in the name of Jesus, this year I hear the sound of celebration. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. I hear the sound of laughter. Amen. There is a party going on and the name is attached to that party. Amen. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I hear the party 
on my behalf. Jesus. I hear the celebration on my behalf. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. In the name of Jesus, I receive that seed Jesus. in the womb of my spirit. Amen. Amen. So, please be seated. So, God would sow. So, that's just real. That's the meaning. But then, there's something also there that is... This thing I told you last week, he went to the gate of Jezreel. Jezreel, there's a palace in Jezreel, the summer palace of Ahab. That is where Jezebel lives. So when Elijah got to the gate, he said, my enemy lives here. And my enemy has been making my life difficult. But I stand at the gate and I invoke Genesis chapter 24 verse 60. That says, you will possess the gate of your enemies. So when I stand at the gate, I cause every enemy activity. Jesus. It shall die in the name of Jesus. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So stand on your, stand on your, on your feet and say, I stand at the gate. I stand at and the I gate. seize the gate. And I seize like the gate. Samson, I take the gate that has imprisoned me. I take that gate and I say that gate will not prevail. Every legislator, every oracle, every incantation, every divination, every spoken word that is against me, against my future, against my progress, against my prosperity, I seize the gate and I overturn. Hallelujah. Learning to take the gate is your portion. Because the brothers of Rebecca said that your son shall possess the gate of their enemies. That is why Samson is coming from a prostitute and even though he has to repent, he, he, he didn't even think to pray. When he saw that they are locked in my head, he just said, Cho. you get it? I like the way the ever said, Chola, Amba, Chola. You get it? I like the way the, 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 the houses will say, Kai. He said, what did they do? Kai. I'm asking you, what did they do to you? Say what? Kai. And then once, when I say, what did they do to you? Say, Chola. Hallelujah. Hey, what did they do to you? When they stood at the gate, what were they thinking? When they made legislature against you, what were they thinking? Chola. Please be seated. So, one of the things that why did Elijah run to Jezreel? The first thing is to seize that gate and change the destiny. And if you remember last week I taught you it was in Jezreel that Jezebel was killed and her body was thrown from the rooftop from the upper floor and dogs began to eat. But I am still interested in Jezreel. And this time I got to know that Jezreel is a valley. Beside every valley is a mountain. Am I talking to somebody? Yes. Beside every valley is a mountain. And so I'm beginning to look what makes Jezreel so special. In fact, the topography, that is a geographical word, the topography of Jezreel has four mountains. That is the structure of Jezreel as a valley. Jezreel is a valley. It has four mountains. Those of you whose teacher died or you didn't know, you didn't study geography like me. You get me? And by the way, please, I was very bad in geography. When I get 50%, God has moved. I'm telling you. You get it? But at least I learned one or two things in order to be able to bully you. You get it? Like topography. <laughs> like the relief. Of, of Jezreel. The relief map of Jezreel. The topography of Jezreel has four mountains. Mountains. Four mountains. And I want to tell you something about mountains. You know, mountains can be raised places. They can be strongholds. They can be positions of opposition. They can be positions of authority and there can be positions where, I mean, resistance and there are strongholds. In actual fact, if you go to Israel, like we went to Israel, there's a place called the Golani Heights. It's a little bit of a raised promontory on, 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 on the soil over there. And if you look at it, it overlooks Jordan and it overlooks Palestine and it overlooks a lot of Syria and all those places. Those, that place, those Golani Heights are very important to the Israelis. So they will never surrender that land because it's the high place so you can look into the valley and it is better when you want to seize the valley you must take a mountain if you take a mountain you can take the valley hallelujah because the mountain gives you gravitational force when your force is coming and they can overrun the, 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 the valley 
So, for Elijah to go to Jezreel, he, he needed to conquer one of the mountains. And that mountain he conquered was Mount Carmel. In fact, there are four mountains around Jezreel. That, that makes Jezreel a valley. The first mountain is called Mount Tabor. The second mountain is the hill of Moreh. The third mountain is Mount Carmel. And the fourth mountain is Mount Gilboa. So there are four mountains on the, on, on the Jezreel, that surrounds the Jezreel Valley. In fact, there are two rivers or there are two streams in, in, in it. One of them is called Kishon and one of them is called uh, Hadol or Hazel. So the mountains of, of this, and you see, Elijah could run into the valley because he had first defeated the altar at, at, at Mount Carmel. He had defeated the prophets of Baal. So once he took Mount Carmel, he can take Jezreel. And God sometimes uses, uh, he, perso he personalizes mountains. So Zechariah chapter, <coughs> in Zechariah chapter 4, I think, Verse 7. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. You will see that God has personalized um, a, a mountain. So Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Let's put it together and let's see. Is there, Who art thou, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. So Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Zechariah is in the o Old Testament, not the New. Just in case. So let's, let's see. Mm, what is happening? Yeah. This is what goes on. You know. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Oh, well, if they won't read it, somebody read it for me. If they can't put it. Who art thou? O oh, great mountain. Before Zerubbabel. Uh huh. Who are, let's, let's all read it together. Salvation has come. Let's all read it together. All right. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings crying, grace, grace unto it. So I am telling you, every obstacle, you can look at that obstacle and say, who are you? Who are you? Tell, um, imagine somebody is an obstacle before you and tell the person, ah, who are you? Before me, you become a plane. In the name of Jesus, may God level every obstacle. May God level every enemy activity. Not because of anything, but because of grace. You are a product of grace. And grace will win the war. And grace will win the fight. And grace will break through for you. In the name of Jesus, you can stand at every mountain and say, This mountain shall be removed. This mountain shall be removed. This mountain shall be removed by my spirit. Is the Lord. See a mountain that you think has confronted you. See an issue that you think has confronted you. See something that you thought you can never defeat. In the name of Jesus, I see grace. I see grace. Whatever you see, I see grace. And grace will deal with it. Not by mind. It's not by power. Oh, by my spirit. It's not by mind. It's not by power, uh -huh. by my spirit is the Lord. Oh, this mountain shall be removed. This mountain. This is the time for you to raise a prayer and bring down that mountain by faith in the name of Jesus. This mountain. If somebody asks you, how is this mountain going to be removed? You say, hey, I do I Oh, 
Hallelujah. Please be seated. So, mountain was personalized and became an enemy to Zerubbabel. In the same way, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4, the Bible says, Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill made low. So, you can see that sometimes God views mountains as places of opposition. Of course, mountains can be places of opposition. Your father's house can be a place of position. Your mother's house can be a place of position. The altar in your family can be a place of opposition. And therefore, every attempt of yours to break through meets resistance. But today, this morning, the story has changed. Am I talking to somebody? I hear on your max. That means you are breaking through. And you are not just breaking through. You are running past it. In the name of Jesus. I speak as an ambassador of the Most High God. I go to your house. Amen. I go to your family. Amen. I go to every tree. Jesus. And I give a command. Ah. Let the altar break. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. On your max. Hey. Get set and shoot. <laughs> Please be seated. So Elijah dealt with Mount Carmel so he can deal with Jezreel, the, the valley of Jezreel. But then there's another mountain over there. It is called the Hill of Moreh. The hill of Moreh. M-O-R-E-H. The hill of Moreh. And you can find the hill of Moreh in, in Judges chapter 7 verse 1. But this story covers Judges chapter 1 to 22. 7 chapter 1 to 22. Now, let's all read it together and be spiritual. Because some of you are dozing. Somebody just yawn. The watcher seller is there. Don't worry. So, okay, let's all read it together. Then Sherubah who is Gideon? And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod. That's one of the things I told you. The well of Harod. So that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. So the Midianites camped in, in, in Moreh. The Midianites camped beside Moreh. That means that Samson or Gideon was on the hill of Moreh. And the Midianites were in the valley and the hill of Moreh. So here's the point. At the hill of Moreh, what does the name Moreh mean? The name Moreh means teaching or teacher. Moreh is where God brings you to teach you. Moreh is the place where God brought Gideon and taught Gideon some life principle. Moreh is the place where God said, I need to teach Gideon and I need to teach Gideon about people. Moreh is the place God brought Gideon and, Gideon and God said to Gideon, there are things Gideon doesn't know about people. So take a good look at somebody sitting by you and say, mm hmm no, no, say it powerfully and say, mm hmm. And if possible, I the person. Mm hmm. <laughs> Moreh is the place God brought Gideon. In actual fact, there are two things that God brought Gideon to. to number one, God brought Gideon to, to, to know about people. And the first type of people God brought uh, uh, Gideon to, to teach him uh, the people with him. So God starts with the people with you before he begins to teach you about the people without. Because your problem is not the people without. Your problem is the people within. If you are no pa. The people with you. The people who are 
outside the Midianites, I want to tell you this, the battle was already won. And all God needed to do was send Gideon down to the valley. And Gideon, he said, go to the camp of the Midianites and hear what they are saying. And the Midianites were already prophesying the victory of Gideon even before he arrived. They are already afraid of you even before you get there. Hallelujah. But it is the people with you. Is that what you call oh, fear? Take a good look at somebody up and down and say, Efienipa. Do it like the proper la woman who took some and eyed the person, bear the person, and say, Efienipa. Those of you from residential area, you don't know how to pair somebody. You don't know how to hide somebody. When I say, look at the person, you are looking at the person like that. No. When the proper la woman wants to pair you, wants to eye you, even they, she should roll the eye like that. When they do that, nobody will tell you. So let's do it like the people are. If you, let me remove the glasses so that you will see. You understand? Look at the person up and down. Do your head like that. And then you raise your eye. Then you turn. Then you roll it and turn it away. I'm teaching you how to quarrel. Come on. And then when you say, then you say, if you're nipa, look at them, look at them. I'm asking. Oh, Nkabu, oh, Tashi. All right, let's do it. You will do it. Otherwise, I'll continue the sermon. Hallelujah. So look at the pair up and down. And then roll your eyes. And then turn away and say, If you need If you want to do it with color, when you look at the pair, then if you need pa. Then you add the two finger down like that. And you bend it as if you are bending it. You get the if you need pa that they are coming down. Hallelujah. It is the Ephianipa. The trouble is not with the Midianites. The trouble is the people with Gideon. And if you look chapter 7 verse 1 to 4, God began to give Gideon what his problem was. There are these three people in your life. There are these three people you are working with. There are these three people. One of them is all you need. You do not need the rest of the two. You need just one of them. So turn to somebody and say, now I know who I need. And I think it is you. So behave yourself. My wife, tell Pastor Enes for him to behave himself. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's read Judges chapter 7. Then you see the three types of people and the person that you need. I've already taught this in church, but I'm, I just want to... Then Jerubal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod. I told you there's the well of Harod, or the river of Harod, the, the distant stream of Harod, and then there's the stream of Kishon. So that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. Now let's read on. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand hath saved me. Let's go on. Uh, now therefore go to proclaiming the ears of the people saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return of the people 20 and 2,000 and there remain 10,000. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water and I will try them for thee there. I think I only cover just one of the first people. The first people don't have faith in your vision. The first people don't have faith in your vision. The opposite of fearfulness is faithless, is faithful. The opposite of fear is faith. Whilst fear has torment, faith has power. So the God was telling Gideon, there are people who are fearful. They don't Believe in your vision. That is why when you're going to do something, tell, I want to do this, I want to do this, then they will tell you that, oh, no, 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 you can't do it. You see, and they'll give you reasons why they can't do, you can't do it. They look at your yesterday and they gauge your tomorrow by what they see in your today. But you are not a 
product of just yesterday and today. There is also a third day that has been allocated unto you. So that baby lying in the manger, that baby lying in the manger, his feet are going to walk upon the sea. His hands are going to heal the sea, the, the sick. So what they see is not what you really are. What you are is what God says. And God calls the things that be not as though they were. So God looks into your future and gives you a definition of yourself. Am I talking to somebody? You are more than what is sitting here. Am I talking to somebody? I see people who are more than what you are sitting here. I see people who are multi-millionaires, who are multi-billionaires. I see people walking in corridors of power. I see people walking in corridors of wealth. I see people walking in corridors of, 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 of influence. In the name of Jesus, get up from your chair. Dance around twice and let everybody say that he has given me speed. He has given me speed. Something is changing. Something is moving. Something is shaking. You are more than what you think you are. Hallelujah. Be seated. Do you know that when you are given the chance, when you give the chance for people to call you or define you, all their definitions will be wrong. Anybody you give a chance to define you, they may make a mistake. Ask somebody just now, who am I? Come on, say powerfully, who am I? Ask the person again, who do you think I am? Ask the person in anger, because the person has been making a mistake all this time. Who do you think I am? Young man, you are sitting by a young girl, that is very nice. You won't tell her who do you think I am. It will change your future. Now, can we say it powerfully? Who do you think, who do you think I am? Do you know that somebody surprised Jesus? Jesus got the shock of his life. When he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? He said, who do men? Put that scripture over there. Who do men say that I am? And the definition they gave of Jesus was not the best. The definition, when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? Put that scripture over there. The people on the, on the laptop over there must be fast now. Don't tell me the computer has slowed. It is you who is slow. Right. I deliver you from slowness and put the scripture over there to help the pastor who is sweating. <laughs> yeah. Under air condition. Tell you, bro. Under air condition. And I'm sweating. And you are sitting. And you are laughing. And sometimes I dance and you won't dance. And sometimes I jump and you won't jump. And you are there. Uh, what do you call Dolu dolus. Give somebody a high five and say, you better show up. And let's have church service. Amen. Jesus made the, the dangerous mistake of asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? Anytime, if you want to be in trouble, ask people to tell you what people are saying about you. It is recipe for trouble. So these days, I don't ask. Because when people, when the day I went to ask, the things I said, Reverend Marque, hmm. that man, you know the cheleo, oh. The, 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 that man is no nonsense. He is not, uh, you see, they're calling me lion. You see? you see? You see the people, you get me? Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Because no more share police, he be. Share police. I'll talk. But I fear British police. And I even feared my father-in-law. God, he's the only man on my wedding day he gave me warning. So you see him with a picture, me and him with a picture, and he's telling me, my friend, no funny thing, and I've raised up my hands. I surrender all. That's why when we got married, I gave my wife four children. Quick, quick, quick. I'm doing maximum damage so my father-in-law cannot change his mind. Well, I've given you for if you like, come and take them away. Yeah, you have to, you say you have me, look at you. Yeah, you have to wage your warfare with wisdom. Uh, David, David is saying, yes, don't, don't sit down over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, that's my son. These days he's trying to frighten me with word of knowledge and this thing. I say, hey, 
And David also is coming from where? And he come and tell me, oh, daddy, I saw, I said, hey, now the, my house is becoming chaotic. Oh. Oh, all my children, they are prophetic now. It's, it's difficult to. So when I think, no, then they'll say it. Someone will come and stand in front of me sweating and say, daddy, I had a dream. And then they'll say, hey. Then Metty too will call. Hmm, daddy, I had, I say, hey, bah. Then Darren too will say, daddy, I saw, I said, hey. So now in my house, I walk gentle and gingerly. Even if I'm angry with their mother, I won't show it. <laughs> now she knows, eh? Yeah. But if I do, no, David will come, Daddy, I think you are, you are. And you see the way, Daddy, I, I think you are, you are. That's the way you talk. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> you get it. Then Sean too will come and stand, then you'll be opening his eyes wide. Daddy, I saw, I saw, I saw. I saw. <laughs> Then, then Darren, Darren will, also, will also come and then squeeze his eyes. I see some Chinese this thing. That is, you know, I think, Daddy, I think that. Uh, then I saw, Mati, hey, Daddy, I think I saw that. I said, Hey! And the worst of them is their mother. <laughs> when you live with such people, you don't make mistakes. Because if you make mistakes, they will catch you. So even if somebody comes to the house and the lady is a nice lady, and I say, Lady is nice in my head, they will tell me. It's not easy in my house, so please pray for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so, so you need to understand that not everybody that is with you, they don't have faith in who you are. They don't have faith in your vision. So they'll become obstacles to your vision. And look at what God said. He said, so far as they are with you, I am not going to bless you. I'm not going to give you the victory. Gideon has suffered poverty. Gideon said, my family is the poorest in the whole of Manasseh, and I am the least amongst them. And God is about to give Gideon the victory. And guess what? Gideon prayed. Gideon gave an offering. Gideon sacrificed. Gideon prayed. Gideon obeyed every instruction. Gideon pulled down an altar. Everything God asked Gideon to do, he did. At the last minute, God said, I won't give you the victory. You have come close to the victory of your life by the person association. And that was a challenge of Gideon. The person beside him or the people beside them, they are faithless. Those who are faithless don't have, they have faith in your vision. They blur your vision with their so-called objectivity. They blur your vision by their so-called negativity. They blur your vision by tell, giving you impossibles. And sometimes they blur your vision with their voice of discouragement, their voice of mockery, and their voice that sends despondency and depression into you. So when you say you want to do something, the way they talk, by the time they finish with you, you are finished. You aborted the dream because of those people who were with you. They don't have faith for your vision. They are fearful. Yes, they say they love you, but they are fearful. You tell them what you tell them what you want to do, and they'll tell it is impossible. Tell them that God is changing my God is changing my, my, my address. And they'll say, You are going where? They don't have faith in your vision at all. They don't have faith in your vision. They look at you and all they do is throw stumbling blocks. Can I tell you something? If you want to walk with Reverend Marquette, then you better have faith. Because I do crazy things. You ask my wife. I made her go and stand at the airport without ticket with the children. And I told them they are traveling. And for three, four weeks, every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday, they go to the airport. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, somebody stood and said, as for me, I don't believe in the faith of uh, Reverend Marco. Me, I have my own faith. You have your own faith, that's fine. But you can't even stand in front of my people and tell them you don't believe in my faith. You have disqualified yourself from, the, my, plat from my platform. Hallelujah. When I say we are going somewhere, 
When I say we are going this thing, all the people in front over there, when I say I am going somewhere, we are going somewhere, you don't ask me why. Come on. Don't ask me why. Turn to somebody and say, never ask him why. Because I'm not under obligation to explain every move of God in, in, in my life and in your life. There are moves that God will ask me to do. I don't know if you ask me. When he told Abraham, I'm taking you to a land that I will show you. Did he show him the land? He didn't show him the land. If you ask Mary, why are you pregnant? You aren't, you aren't going to get it. Because, hey, there are, there are questions. And the things of God is not everything that I understand. The Bible says the way of the Lord is in the sea. If you like, map. Go and put a flag in the sea and map it. Tomorrow, a wave will come and carry it away. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the way of the Lord is in the sea. Nobody cuts a path in the sea. Even if you ask the ship, ship navigators, can I tell you something? They plot, but hey, they have to, you know, they don't go by. Sometimes a wave will come that will throw you somewhere else. Another wave will come that will throw you somewhere else. Hey, that is how God moves with us. One wave will take you up. Another wave will bring you down. But because you believe that God is the captain of the ship, his hands are on the steering wheel. And even though you can't see from afar, he can't see what he's doing. He's still up to something. You don't even know. The brothers of David, they came to David and they said to David in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David said, I'm going to kill the giant, they said, don't we know you and the naughtiness of your heart? They tried to kill the faith of, of David. There are some people, don't even argue with them. Turn your back towards them. And the Bible said, David turned and said to them, is there not a cause? Turn to somebody and tell the person, is there not a cause? There's a reason why God wants to bless me. There's a reason why God wants to increase me. There's a reason why God wants to promote me. There's a reason why God is lifting me up. Watch out this year. You hear the name of Reverend Marquis. A lot. Hallelujah. Watch out. I am coming. Oh, I am coming. If you like, sit down. Don't take it for yourself. Ha. Huh. Families will come and bow before you because they are hearing your name. In the name of Jesus. The kingly anointing is in the house. The anointing for wealth. The anointing to walk in influence. And the anointing to walk in power. In the name of Jesus. The kingly anointing is here to anoint you to operate in the marketplace. Am I talking to somebody? So wealth is coming. In the name of Jesus. I break the barrier. I break the remove the, the hindrance. In the name of Jesus. When the build a wall you will jump over the wall when they raise the troop you will run through the troop in the name of Jesus am I talking to somebody if you don't untie yourself from faithless people you will die to the grave because they will kill you hey can I tell you something if I say we are going somewhere, you don't ask me why. You have to ask me how. Then what shall we do? Where and when? Hallelujah. There are people who think that they are, because they are associated with me, you have to ask why. If you don't know, and you come and ask me why, I will give you Labadi response. And when I finish talking, when you walk a few meters, it will hit you. The response I gave to you, then you yourself will best start crying. Because I've given you the word. You don't ask how. Or you don't ask why. So I told, did you like 31st? Didn't you see what God did? Were you excited by it? <laughs> because I am not entitled to know every detail of God's plan. I am not entitled. Revelation is progressive. He moves step by step. So Jacob didn't see a straight wooden plank. He didn't see a straight path. But he saw a, a, a ladder. Step by step by step. So I stepped. Line upon line, precept upon precept. God never gave the full picture to Abraham. He said to a land, I will show you. So first get out and obey the first principle. Then you are ready for the second revelation. Hallelujah. 
That is what it is. Moses, God is leading you to take Israel out of Egypt. And then you take them to the Red Sea. Is there common sense at the Red Sea? Why are you taking the people you are running with to uh, sea? Why would a general, a good general, take people to, to, to a water where they can't retreat? Every good general plans how to retreat. How to withdraw from the battle. But Moses took them to the Red Sea. Behind them was the Egyptians. In front of them was the Red Sea. What do you do? Then this is when the nye, 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 nye people will come. Yes, me, I knew it. You knew what? You knew your mother. I mean, I knew it. I knew that will come. I knew that. You, you know what? I, I knew that it will fail. May God reward you if you ever say that. May you also never break through. You knew what? God brought Moses to a place called nonsense. It was nonsensical. But guess what? He brought them to the place. Meanwhile, he told Moses, I am going to take you out with great deliverance. So he brings them to a Red Sea. Why? Because he wants to open up the sea for his people to walk in safety. And then when Pharaoh tries and drives his army into the Red Sea, he will shut the army up and drown them all. So the enemy they see, they won't see them anymore. Am I talking to somebody? Why? It is why God takes you to hard places. You call it between a hard place and a rock. But I came to tell you, it is called God's provision. It is called God's guidance. It is called God's pathway. Hey. Hallelujah. Hey. If God takes you to a cemetery, he wants you to raise up bones. If God takes you into the fire, he wants the fourth man to be present. If God takes you into a lion's den, he's about to shut the mouth of lions and give you a testimony. Hallelujah. The reason why you are where you are is not because you didn't obey. You are where you are because you obeyed. And see what God is about to do. Am I talking to somebody? Be careful who you associate with. They are dream killers. They are fearful people. They don't believe in your vision. They don't believe in your vision. You know, the God I serve, my goodness. You heard me say, I took my wife and my children to the next time. They flew, and they flew business class. And they flew business class in blind obedience. It was not easy for me. Because I'm also walking my, my road of faith. I'm also walking my road where God is building my faith. I'm also walking on the road where God is telling me, I'm teaching you. So you know, you need to trust me. I am going to the place of total trust. I have to come to a place where I don't care anymore. I have to come to a place when I hear God say, God said this. I just obey without thinking because I know he's about to do something. I speak to you in the name of Jesus. This year, God is going to provide you with opportunities. It's not everybody you can go into that opportunity in the name of Jesus. Amen. Break away from those people. Jesus name. They said you can't prosper. Turn to somebody. We we'll wait and see. They say you high you high Uber until this thing. Tell the person when I high Uber, I'm going from Chado to Zenith, and I don't want to drive. They tell you they tell you that you are going to rent all the rest of your life. Tell somebody who told you. I see my house coming up. I am building my own house. In the name of Jesus. Amen. They said life cathedral is not going to happen. Wait and see. You don't need those people around you. Because they will undermine your faith. Little, little statements they make. They are like knives. Or like pins in a balloon. God inflates your balloon with faith. And then they poke a pin in it. And then you have, boom. Your balloon just got burst. Your dreams begin to fade. Your, 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 the vision be, 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 begins to blur and you can't see properly because somebody opened their 32 and spoke and prophesied from the devil. Do you know that people can prophesy from the devil? Do you know that? Yes, people can prophesy from the devil and it is very, very easy for people to prophesy from the devil. People don't know it, but it's a reality. Hey, and the people can be anointed, they can be very good people, but they still they are speaking from the devil. Hey, devil, devil, devil. 
Hey, now Jesus said, I'm going to die. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Then Peter said, it will not happen. And then Jesus, what did he say? Get thee behind me, Satan. You, I'm calling you devil and you are angry. But Jesus, he called somebody Satan. He want me to call you Satan. Satan, 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 Satan. Make Satan, 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 Satan. And the reason why, because it is not Peter speaking. It is the devil speaking. Am I talking to somebody? Who is talking to you? Who are you listening to? Who is prophesying into your spirit? Who is saying things that won't happen? Who is saying it? Who is talking about whether the fact that do you think that God will do it or God will not do it? Who is saying that? Who is undermining your faith? Take a good look at somebody and tell the person, you dare not. Come on, say it again powerfully. You dare not. Because if you bring your voice, I will reply. You know, one of the things, when they talk, then you keep quiet. That's your problem. You have been quiet too long. You have been quiet too long. When they say it, according to our Bishop Williams, when they say, you too, shade. Hallelujah. When they talk, you too what? Say it. And it's very, very simple. You see, when, when, when David's brothers came talking, he said, is there not a cause? And then he turned away. When Goliath spoke and spoke fear, David came and kept quiet. David also came and spoke of faith. He said, today, I will make you like this. I will do this to you. Daniel, they said, you, I'll throw you into the lion's den. He said, I don't care. You can throw me into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I will throw you into the fire. And he said, you can throw me into the fire. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. Because when I enter the fire, hey, the fourth man is going to show up. Until then, Jesus had not revealed himself to those heathen. But the fact that he came in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they knew the secret. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't see the fourth man. But it was those people who put him in the fire, they saw the fourth man. So they won't see, you won't see the fourth man. But the people who put you in that soup, they will see God deliver you. And then they'll say, ah, this person is of God. In the name of Jesus, name because of you Jesus. are anchored on the word of God, hey. you are anchored on God, Jesus. you are not anchored on any man. In the name of Jesus, the name when of they Jesus. talk, you can also say, We have an anchor that keeps the soul. I'm steadfast as you while the beat I'm fasting to the rock which can. Not to I'm grounded, firm and deep in the Savior's love. I'll continue this on another day. But I came to tell you, you are more than a conqueror. I see victory crowns being placed upon you. You are bigger than what they said. You are bigger than your limitation. You are bigger than the warfare. You are bigger than it. Why? Because there's another people who have acknowledged that you are more than a conqueror. Am I talking to somebody? No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. When they throw an arrow against you, it shall not hurt. Hey, the arrow that fly by day, not the pestilence that come by night, it shall not touch you because you are rooted. You are anchored in the word. Am I talking to somebody? Jump from your chair and say yes. yes. Open your mouth and pray. Build your faith. Cut those people away. Cut them away. Cut them away. Cut them away. Cut them away. To be continued, cut them away. To be continued, cut them away. To be continued, cut them away.
Hello, people of God. We are so glad you joined us today, both online and in person. On behalf of our General Overseer, Reverend Dr. Beniza Marque, and First Lady, Reverend Dr. Mrs. Davina Marque, thank you for joining us today. 2024 is our year of divine speed. Amen. Here are a few announcements. We'll start off with a funeral announcement. The funeral arrangements of the late Honorable Novalis Ganslate are as follows. Waykeeping, Friday, 26th January 2024. The venue is Okumese Apanchewi La. Time is 8 p.m. Attire or black. The burial service will take place on Saturday, 27th January at the La Nativity Presbyterian Church in La at 10 a.m. and the funeral rites at Trade Fair. Attire is black and white. The Thanksgiving service is on Sunday, the 28th of January at the same venue. Time is 10 a.m. Attire is all white. He was a father of Gudia Meyao, a member of the Loft Prayer Team, a service floor manager, and Juicy Gans Latte of the Hospitality Team. Let us show our support and continue to keep the family in our prayers. Our first week of our 21 days have been awesome and we are being blessed by principles taught each day by our Papa and are getting charged for the new year, getting charged for divine speed and getting charged to recover all in 2024. Don't miss out any of the scheduled prayer times. Join us here every weekday evening to pray at 6 30 p.m. and also online on Zoom at 4:30 a.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays and plug in on Fridays led by the crew. There will also be coconuts and smoothies available for sale after the services to help you break your fast in a healthy way. Remember to invite a friend to pray. This is our year of divine speed. Amen. Amen. Join Reverend Dr. Beneza Marquay on Dominion TV on the Bridging the Gap show. Discover the profound insights airing on DSTV channel 352 or Go TV channel 213 on Sunday the 28th of January 2024 at 4 p.m. prompt. Don't miss this enriching conversation, bridging gaps and fostering understanding. Ah, this one we know okay. is easy. Tell us. Oh. Why? Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> Wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Ah, my good friend, my mm -hmm. good lady. Oh, Mary Magdalene. Mary, Mary Magdalene. Yeah. No, oh. but I said. Hey, hey, hey. No, 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 no. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Loft Podcast. Introducing the Loft Podcast. This is the new and exciting Christian podcast you've been waiting for. Immerse yourself in captivating stories, thought-provoking conversations, and of course, bear banter. Subscribe to our channels now on The Loft Pod on YouTube, IG, and TikTok, and embark on a new audio adventure. The Loft, transformed to transform. <laughs> glory, glory. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. This is the People Oriented Church, Living Streams International, where life flows.